morning. Uh, good day. Good morning. Good day. Uh, I'm James Rattenleaf, and I want to welcome you and uh, begin our time together with a traditional Lakota uh, greeting uh, from my tribe or from my nation here in the United States of America. So we say, how midakuyapi chanter washte napechi zapolo. James Rattenleaf, imachiapi na suichango Lakota oyate hemataha. From my heart, uh, I greet you with a handshake. And I'm known, known as James Rowlingleaf, and I'm from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe or Sioux Nation in the United States of America. It's my great pleasure to, to serve as your moderator today uh, for this. Uh, I think this is going to be a great event. Uh, it's an event sponsored uh, by the Geo Indigenous Alliance, which is uh, the group that I'm part of. Also, the Geo Aquawatch, the Water Quality Initiative, with support from CSIRO's Aquawatch Australia. International Association for Great Lakes Research and the World Water Quality Alliance. This is part of a, a series um, by the GEO and Program Fund called the Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Subgroup. So this recording, this event is going to be recorded and a link will be shared via email to all registrants following the event. This recording link is also part, uh, also likely to be made available in various co-sponsors website so we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to hear our our great speakers today so audience members so who you are you are um will only be have the opportunity to place your questions in the q a window so that um, the, the speakers and monitors can see them and respond to them so please feel free uh to use the webinar chat to introduce yourself which i think is really great and also provide your location and your affiliation so there's a, there is a shared purpose behind this webinar uh, our, and the co-sponsors and sharing global qual global water quality information about and from Earth observations for the benefit of all society. So we hope to achieve three things today. Uh, to recognize International Day of, of the World's Indigenous Peoples, amplify the voices of Indigenous people on the issue of water quality, and certainly, and most importantly, I would say raise awareness of the value of traditional knowledge and including indigenous people as equal partners in, in water quality earth observation projects. So it's important again that we um, we do that and, and as we do in all the things that we do, um, we wanna make sure that um, we begin our, our day in the right way. Um, so before I do that, uh, I wanna also say that we have objectives and I wanna, don't forget that is to share and discuss the MAGIC, M-I-M-A-G-I-K, teams recently published best practices and recommendations for including Indigenous people and their earth observation knowledge systems into water quality projects and product development. And finally, to provide a forum for Indigenous scholars from around the world to present their water quality use cases and success stories. And so, as I said earlier, we, um, we want to begin our time together in a, what we say a good way or appropriate way. And so with that, I'm gonna ask uh, Dawn Martin-Hill if she would open us up now in, in her way so we can get our day started. So with, the, with that, Dawn, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, we scan all. Um, this is something that our community uh, Haudenosaunee people have done since time immemorial. And it opens up our radio stations in the morning. Um, all of our children recite this every day. And it's much longer than what I'm sharing with you today. This is the abbreviated version, given the time restraints and in English, um, given the wide birth of our audience. So the Gnyo Hanyo is said um, to acknowledge the teaching that instructs us of all interrelated and interdependent parts of the natural world. It is our paradigm. It is our thought, Haudenosaunee thought, that we operate, including all science projects that I do, operate within this law of the land. It's not man-made. It was given to us by the creator, and it's encoded our values, culture, and way of being. And it reminds us, more importantly, of our duties, responsibilities to care for one another, and all the gifts of creation. Next slide. The people today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one, as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. 
the waters, we give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know the power, sorry. We know the power in many forms, waterfalls and rains, mist, streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirit of water. Now our minds are one. We are all thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. We return our minds to the fish in the water. They were instructed to cleanse and purify the water. They also give themselves to us as food. We are grateful. Sorry, the messages are popping up. We are grateful that we can still find pure water. So we turn now to the fish and send our <laughs> greetings and thanks to the waters. Now our minds are one. The plants now, we turn towards the vast fields of plant life. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain in many life forms. With our minds gathered together, we give thanks and look forward to seeing plant life for many generations to come. Now our minds are one. Next slide. The food plants with one mind, we turn to honor and thank all the food plants we harvest from the garden. Since the beginning of time, the grades, vegetables, beans, and berries have helped the people survive. Many other living things draw strength from them too. We gather all the plant foods together as one and send them greetings of thanks. Now our minds are one. The medicine herbs, we turn to all the medicine herbs of the world. From the beginning, they were instructed to take away sickness. They are always waiting and ready to heal us. We are happy there are all still among us, those special few who remember how to use these plants for healing. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the medicines and to the keepers of the medicines. Now our minds are one. Animals, we gather our minds together to send greetings and thanks to the animal life in the world. They have many things to teach us as people. We are honored by them when they give us their lives so we may use their bodies as food for our people. We see them near our homes and in the deep forest. We are glad that they are still here and we hope that it will always be so. Now our minds are one. The trees, we turn our thoughts to the trees. The earth has many families of trees who have their own instructions and uses. Some provide us with shelter and shade, others with fruit, beauty, and other useful things. Many people of the world use a tree as a symbol of peace and strength. With one mind, we greet and give thanks to the tree of life. Now our minds are one. The birds, we put our minds together and give thanks to all the birds who move and fly about over our heads. The creator gave them beautiful songs. Each day they remind us to enjoy and appreciate life. The eagle was chosen to be their leader. To all the birds from the smallest to the largest, we send our joyful greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one. Next slide. The four winds, we are thankful to the powers we know as the four winds. We hear their voices in the moving air as they refresh us and purify the air we breathe. They help us to bring the change of seasons. From the four directions they come, bringing us messages and giving us strength. With one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to the four winds. Now our minds are one. The thunderers, now we turn to the west where our grandfathers, the thunder beings, live. With lightning and thundering voices, they bring with them the water that renews life. We are thankful that they keep those evil things that were made by the bad twin underground. We bring our minds together as one to send greetings and thanks to our grandfathers. The thunderers, now our minds are one. The sun, we send greetings and thanks to our eldest brother, the sun. Each day without fail, he travels the sky from west from east to west, bringing light of the new day. He is the source of all fires of life. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our brother, the sun. Now our minds are one. The stars, we give thanks to the stars who spread across the sky like jewelry. We see them in the night, helping the moon to light the darkness and bring dew to the gardens and growing things. When we travel at night, they guide us home. With our minds gathered together as one, we send greetings and thanks to the stars. Now our minds are one. Next slide. Grandmother Moon, we put our minds together to give thanks to our oldest grandmother, the moon, 
who lights the nighttime sky. She is a leader of women all over the world, and she governs the movement of the oceans. By her changing face, we measure time, and it is the moon who watches over the arrival of children here on Earth. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our grandmother, the moon. Now our minds are one. The enlightened teachers, we gather our minds to greet and thank the enlightened teachers who gave, have come to help throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live as the people. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to these caring teachers. Now our minds are one. The creator, now we turn our thoughts to the creator or great spirit and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live good life is here on Mother Earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the creator. Now our minds are one. In the closing words, which I won't do at the end of this, we usually end up closing our meetings with, with a, a Ganyo Hanyo as well. We arrive at this place. So hopefully we will arrive with the intention of not leaving anything out. And if I have forgotten something, we leave to each individual to send greetings and thanks in their own way. Now our minds are one. Well, thank you. Hello. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Don, for those um, inspiring words and to help us uh, set our minds right in a good way. And, and our minds are one. Uh, we have a number of, of uh, inspiring speakers here today that uh, we want to begin with. And so I want to thank, thank you for being here and um, greet you again. And in our way, our first, um, our first presenter will be uh Yolanda Lopez Maldonado and Janet S. Anstey from the Magic Team, and they'll be talking about the contributions of Indigenous Peoples' Earth observations to water quality monitoring. So the floor is yours, um, Yolanda and Janet. Thanks very much, James. I'd like to... Um, First begin um, by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands that we're all meeting on today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. At, at CSIRO, we believe that First Nations people have significant contributions to make in cultural, economic and scientific domains. Next slide, please, Yolanda. In light of that, CSIRO Aquawatch the group of Earth Observations, GEO Aquawatch, and the GEO Indigenous Alliance submitted a proposal titled Melding Aquawatch and Global Indigenous Knowledge into the Innovation Workshop on Water Quality Monitoring and Assessment that was organised by the World Meteorological Organisation, the World Water Quality Alliance, and the United Nation Programs, UNEP, UNESCO and UNITA. The theme of our proposal was finding value in data sharing, ensuring trust and relationship buildings. As Aquawatch Australia and Geo Aquawatch aim to work with First Nations people in their programs involving satellite earth observations and water quality. The three-day workshop that, we uh, that was held in September to 2023 brought together subject matter experts to innovate and my colleague Yolanda will now present the findings and recommendations from this workshop in our recent paper. Thank you for joining us and I look forward to the session. Uh, thank you very much, Janet, and thank you very much for uh, joining us today. This is a very special webinar for all of us because after the workshop we had uh, last year, we have been able to continue with our collaboration and strengthening uh, collaboration as well for bringing to the forefront of Earth observations the contributions of Indigenous peoples, um, uh, in particular in water quality monitoring um, issues. But of course, um, I will explain a little bit more um, what is our main uh, focus. So um, very recently, we were able to publish uh, this paper, which was um, very collaborative, uh, very meaningful for all of us, because we were able to put together different ideas that uh, come up and that arise from the workshop that my colleague Janet just mentioned. Um, it's um, free, uh, so you can go and access it. And um, I have here the, the DO 
um, um, the link. And but of course we can also share it here um, in the chat. Um, so essentially, we realized during the workshop that there were a lot of uh, gaps in terms of um, data because sometimes we have a lot of global um, data collecting water quality monitoring data, but it's very difficult to make sense at local scale of, of this information. Um, but I want to share here with you this map. Uh, this is the map of the lands managed and controlled by indigenous peoples. And we can see in the purple um, in the purple areas that indigenous peoples are spread almost in, in 90 countries. They manage um, a quarter of the world land surface. They, they protect important ecosystems and the most important biodiverse areas, which of course um, we need um, good water quality for, for that. Um, and this is despite they represent less that, that, than 6% of the world population. So we really wanted to, to bring the knowledge and the observations of indigenous peoples into this regard, because we um, consider that it's also very relevant to include um, these observations into water quality monitoring and to make sense at the, of global, global scale. So our key findings were that indigenous peoples report precise and accurate observations of changes in earth systems. And this paper focused only on the hydrological cycle, but of course, um, indigenous peoples um, are pretty good in, in uh, observing natural phenomena um, in a wider um, approach on a wider scale. And this information uh, can significantly enhance global outreach and engagement efforts, aiding in the understanding of hydrological cycle components. So it's essential to enable indigenous peoples to contribute their scientific knowledge and this complex scientific thought in the use of earth observations. Um, this is also crucial for the protection of other vital components of the water cycle. So essentially, we address two main questions as part of this publication. And what are the opportunities to include indigenous knowledge into earth observations? And what are the main challenges in doing so? And today we will explore some examples that um, relates very well with our questions that we address as part of this of this publication. So essentially, uh, we try to convey some ideas about how those uh, indigenous people's earth observations are precise, are accurate, are important um, in, in, in some of those components of the hydrological cycle from cryosphere, snow glaciers, permafrost, lakes, groundwater, ocean atmosphere, etc. And we uh, come up with some policy recommendations and also recommendations as part of our MAGIC um, a group. So essentially, we really uh, call to respect and recognize indigenous earth observations, indigenous protocols when working with indigenous knowledge holders, and as well when accessing and using shared knowledge. Uh, also, uh, we encourage to support indigenous peoples in maintaining and increasing indigenous knowledge by providing capacity capacity within communities and include communities in the definition of research questions, data collection and interpretation of results, which is very relevant. Also, um, we recommend to engage with indigenous peoples um, to, uh, to make use of the free prior informed consent form to meet water quality SDG goal, uh, goals and to contribute to the uh, United Nations um, uh, what's the <laughs> in English, United Nations Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Principles Globally. Um, also to allow indigenous peoples to be local observer, observers and that have their own methodologies for research inquiry, to support community-based long-term and local environmental observing and monitoring, and to recognize past and current role of indigenous institutions, uh, non-indigenous scientists and policymakers. Uh, we really need to be aware of past and ongoing impacts of colonial ways of doing research and when working alongside indigenous communities. So essentially, our final comments is that earth science, earth observation, most include indigenous knowledge, their observations and understandings of the environment into the measuring and monitoring process because it's uh, ethically important to do so and also policy relevant. And 
uh, methods and frameworks for observing the hydrological cycles should be informed by indigenous, indigenous intellectual traditions, as stated by many indigenous scholars that are here with us. So essentially, um, I really want to, to bring um, a few ideas of our paper, but I would like you to share with, with all of you this, this manuscript and to receive your suggestions for the recommendations and to keep um, in, in contact with, with you. So thank you very much, and I um, will stop sharing. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Yolanda, and thank you, Janet, uh, for that um, for that presentation. Again, uh, with questions, please put it in the chat, and so Yolanda and Janet can respond. Our next presenter will be uh, Brad uh, Mogridge, Indigenous Leadership and Engagement, University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. He'll be talking about the cultural value of water and the importance of understanding water quality for Aboriginal people. So with that, Brad, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Our video is good to go. All right, I'll just share my screen. Now, are you seeing the display settings for the full screen? All good? All good. Awesome. Fantastic. Thanks very much and beautiful welcome, Dawn. Thank you so much for, for getting us ready for tonight and um, James for, for comparing and then our previous speakers and all the rest of the speakers. I, you know, hopefully we can deliver a, a solid, solid platform. Uh, just noting that um, note the cleansing smoke and yeah, just some photos I use uh, of people that have passed away and obviously get the feeling that um, that smoke is cleansing and taking their spirits up to the sky. And obviously while we're talking, that smoke also takes our, our talking on, on, on land about water um, up to the sky so the ancestors are happy. I acknowledge country. I'm on Ngunnawal country here in Canberra. Um, it's currently... 10, 15, 10 20 p.m. So I'm getting ready for bed. Um, I am on Ngunnawal country. I'm a Kimilaroi man. You can sort of see the chunk of, of my nation there on the eastern seaboard. Some of my old people that have passed on now and the, the next generation, my kids, um, at, at one of our significant water holes there. Um, and water is a key part of who we are. So really, this is just a, an explainer of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land that's, that's, and these are all the language groups. These are all diverse groups and um, different protocols, different languages. We don't understand each other. We might have some common words across Australia, but um, different law, different cultural practice, different traditions. And in modern context, we have different capacity and obviously governance and, and our time constraints are also different as well. Um, Look, I want to put forward a, a water quality model that's also out there. Um, it was Australian New Zealand committed in 2009 to reviewing the ANZAC guidelines for water quality. And um, they also provided the opportunity to have guidance for Indigenous cultural and spiritual values. So there was two Indigenous reps, from one from Australia, one from New Zealand. Um, I was lucky to, to be the Australian delegate and Roku Mihinui from New Zealand in Tiarawa was the other. Um, we, we represented our own cultural connections um, and we sought approval from our elders and his iwi and, and his elders to avoid approving on behalf of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Māori people. So, and then we gave our, our components to the departments um, from Australia and New Zealand. Then they had, then they had to consult and in 2018, the Australian New Zealand Guidelines for Fresh and Marine Water Quality was born. Uh, there's a link there. But And in 2009, we, we got together in Wellington in New Zealand and uh, we talked about water quality itself. And what we come out of it was with nine principles, which we explain in, um, it, that's a website link there down below, the Australian Government uh, Environment Department. And, you know, we talked about the living earth, traditional law and customs, language itself, uh, traditional knowledge, 
uh, gender, so men's and women's aspects of, of water quality, well-being, how it relates to the quality of water, intergenerational responsibilities. Our actions today will impact or hopefully improve water quality for the next generation. Cultural ev evolution, if, uh, if we don't evolve culturally, we will just fade away into to the history books. Um, we have evolved, we've survived, um, and obviously we're still here. Um, connectivity is us connecting to place, and within that place is the land, water, and skies. So this is just a, quite a simple diagram, which says a lot, I believe. So out at the centre, you have healthy water, and they're all interconnected, and we have healthy country, which is the land we live on, healthy culture, and obviously healthy people. So in the, the framework in the, in the guidelines uh, provides uh, from starting a conversation with Indigenous people all the way to implementing a water quality management plan. And it helps you or guides you through monitoring, evaluating and adapting. Um, so they, these, are, they, these are there. And then there's obviously return routes if you don't, don't succeed. So the idea of building a water quality management plan was around time. Make sure you have enough time dedicated to develop those cultural and spiritual values for those plans. You cannot rush this. Um, I have a, a three T's model, which is building trust over time, over cups of tea. Um, and you can obviously adapt that to if you, if you like other teas, um, but Time is crucial and obviously your communities and elders will see through you if you're not, if you don't come with integrity. So over time you build a relationship and potentially you can get to that point to start talking water quality. Indigenous perspective may, may not match your management time, time frames as, as a potential government, government agency. So you, you need to, to be wary of that. There may be roadblocks or challenges that you face in your engaging and obviously where there's opportunity. So you'll have men's and women's business, um, sorry business, which for us is, is funerals. Um, some key aspects may not translate well and might need, might need to be expressed clearly. And some, some communities, English might not be the first language in Australia. So, you know, you, you have those challenges as well. So you need the time to make sure that you're, you're ready to go. And then obviously don't wait to the last minute, otherwise you will fail. Um, and obviously that's happened a lot. And, and unfortunately, Indigenous people miss out because when it fails, their culture and spiritual values aren't considered in, in water quality planning. Um, so this is, we also created the, the guidelines as well as the principles and the guidelines link to current um, water quality guidelines that we have in, in the Australian New Zealand uh, context. So well, um, Health and health of water and sea country, you know, that's the physical aspect and chemical stresses that that can impact your water quality. So DO is dissolved oxygen. Our our freshwater crayfish, if they're walking out of water holes backwards, because they crawl backwards, um, that means the dissolved oxygen is is unfit for them. And they're pretty tough species. So that's that's a sign that that water quality is not that good. So there are cultural indicators out there that actually determine what water quality is. So, you know, that's something you explore as a water quality manager. Um, and other there's there's those other ones as well. You know, the, the, the human cultural aspects of water quality. So the taste, the smell, the feel, the look of water, they all, they all connect to what water quality is. Um, not, not just, you know, you might have your, your, your normal stresses, pH, um, um, dissolved oxygen, salinity, and all those other ones. But I suppose these, these other ones are what our elders feel. Um, Site-specific um, values can be developed to protect culturally important aquatic or water quality dependent species, such as fish, fish and birds, which are, are our cultural keystone species. Is the water culturally safe to drink and for food collection? So that they also link to the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines. Is the water safe for recreation? So that's primary contacts, you know, your favourite swimming hole. You know, like the elders say now that they've got to take bottled water to go, go for a fish. 
you know, whereas they used to drink the waters uh, when, you know, when they were quite young. So water quality has changed a lot. Uh, water supports economic well-being, you know, for harvesting those cultural species, but also for, for sustenance or, and food. But there's also the opportunity of, of having good water quality and quantity um, for aquaculture projects, so your primary industries. So these are just these are just the links, the cultural and spiritual value guidelines um, on the Australian government's uh, website, and they're there to be used by water quality managers, and that'll do me. And that's my beard growing mainly over COVID. And that's me. That's that's <laughs> my latest selfie. Uh, it's with the crater, the caldera of Mount Vesuvius in in Italy. So uh, that's that's a cool one, I reckon. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Brad. That was great. And um, five years ago, I got to visit your country for the Geo Indigenous, uh, the Geo uh, Ministerial Summit. And I really enjoyed my time there. Awesome. It was great to, uh, was great to uh, hear you talk again, Brad. And thank you again for your your work, but also um, your your part of this um, this gathering here today. Um, thank you. Our next our next presenter will be uh, Elizabeth Veronica Wambrau from. Indonesia, and she'll be talking about water governance in perspective of Indigenous people in uh, Indonesia. So with that, Elizabeth, your floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I'm going to try to share my screen. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, yes, I'm from Indonesia, but actually from the Papua is uh, what is the, the eastern part of uh, Papua Island. So sometimes people confuse people between uh, Papua or Papua New Guinea. So my uh, research about uh, water governance from the perspective of indigenous people in Papua, actually it's the begin is it began when I did my study in New Zealand. Uh, so I just uh, focus on this. Uh, indigenous people knowledge since 2012. So uh, from the outline are only my original tribe, I'm from Biak tribe. When you see in the map, I mean like Papua is the red one. And then my tribe is from the small island above the Papua island from Biak. But now I will talk about the three uh, tribe in Papua, the Malin Anim, the Sambom people, and then the Ngalum uh, people. So, uh, I mean, like, probably uh, you already know, but, I mean, like, because in uh, between Papua and Papua New Guinea, we have a half Papua and a half Papua New Guinea, but in Papua, we only have still 269 ethnic group and then 269 living languages and more than 100 clients. And then all the tribe is uh, separated into, we have like seven customary uh, zone, uh, Bombarai, Dombarai, Sasarai, Mamta, Mepago, Lapago, and Haani. Ha ha Probably now today you, you can see in Indonesia, especially in Papua, now the what is the government spread the administrative area according to the customary zone. And then in Papua, we have uh, uh, five big uh, river basin, Kamundan Sebiar, Omba, and Leiden, Bikumadigul, Memramo, Tami, Apafur, Wapoga, and Mimika. And then it's more than 153 water seed, 15 lakes, and 400 gone water uh, basin. It means more of the tribe of, of the people would be living in the water body. So I mean, like, actually, when we talk about the, what is the Papuan, the tribe, and then water is a part of the Papuan uh, people. So I mean, like for this time, I only will talk about uh, uh, what is three tribe. The first, the first is Malin Anim. Malin Anim people is located in the southern part of Papua, with the border area between Papua and Papua New Guinea. So some Malin Anim uh, have the territory in Papua and some in Papua New Guinea. And then from if we related with the gov water governance of the uh, the Malin people. Actually, Malin people have the concept of they call like traditional uh, cultivation system. They call it wombat. So wombat is like they what is they what is elevated the garden bed, and then they, they because we know in the southern part of Papua is really what is 
they in the lowland area. So only I think uh, what is cross with the Australia. So only hundred uh, what is a half meter uh, above the water sea level. So I mean like the the people just digging the the bed and then they make a cultivation like the picture and then around the uh, what is under the the garden they make a like drainage system so the the wamba they call like the uh, wamba and the, the drainage system they call kamahit actually when we talk about the water the uh, malin anim already relies about how they can adapt with climate change for example when the a lot of a uh, rainy season sometimes the area will be flooding so they will they will control the flooding with the kamahip uh, drainage system but while the during dry season the kamahip system will be used as a water storage so they already the, they, they already have the concept to adapt with the climate change the other the other value of the water uh, in the water from the marine people they have really spiritual with the relationship, probably the same with other indigenous people in the world. But they have the, they also have uh, the concept of uh, Dema and the totem, which means related between the, the nature, the landscape with the people. So I mean like for them, they will really, they really maintain the ecosystem to protect their identity, to protect the ancestor like that. And then the next, I mean like my, based on my research, I learned about the Malin, uh, people and then asthma people when I did my uh, study, but uh, but uh, after that one I really focus in other 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 tribe and then another example here the Sambom people. The Sambom people is like part of uh, my uh, student uh, what is uh, thesis, so I supervise her and then learn about how the Sambom uh, people uh, maintain the water. So I mean like the people, some of people live in the mountain area of the Papua. So I mean like they're part of uh, Lapago custom uh, custom zone. When a uh, tribe uh, marine anim in the ha anim uh, zoning and then they're in the middle area. So I mean like based on this one, actually the people in the, in the what is the, in the fillers, they already have the rule to to manage the, the water. This is the picture, the sketch picture of my student. So actually the Sambon people have their already traditional zoning to utilize the water. They have the five zoning to use the water. The zone A, only they uh, they said, they believe the area around the zoning A are sacred place. So they cannot, everyone cannot uh, come into the forest because it's sacred. And then, uh, they really protect their, their area. So, I mean, like, if we connect to the modern, uh, like, right now, actually, they already practice how to they conserve the other area. And then the second one about the zone B. The zone B people use only for drinking the water. And then the zone C only for domestic purpose, like uh, dishing, washing, and anything. And zone D only for uh, men for uh, tech bathing. And then the son E only for women. So I mean, like actually, the the Sambom people already have their own rule to govern the the water. If we related to Indonesian, uh, uh, what is uh, the rule regulation? They said that the, when they we use the water, we have to care about three types: the conservation, the utilization, and then how to uh with uh, reduce, uh control the disaster of the the water. So actually, the Sambum people already done this because they already think about how they conserve the water. The rule in Indonesia say you cannot do anything around the what is under the river basin like around two hundred meter, but the people already protect the area around one kilometers. So I mean, like they really, they really do the the they really do the rule in a better way. And then the second uh. Uh, one, they already utilize. They they know how to utilize it as a part of the zone to support their uh, daily life. And then the last time, they already protect the area to control the the flooding too, because they really uh what is restrict the people can do anything around the the river. So I mean, like the people really really care about how they maintain the the what is the nature and then how they use the water. And then the last one about the Sukungalum. Sukungalum is located in the 
in the middle of uh, the mountainous area, which is a border area with uh, with Papua New Guinea too. So uh, two of the three tribe that I present now is like uh, in the mid and the what is in the border area between Papua and Papua New Guinea. So one of the concept of the Ngalung people, and then I directly come last uh, last two week from the area, from the uh, Star Mountain Regency or Pegunungan Bintang. Actually, the people of Suku Ngalung have the concept of water. So I mean, like they they use a uh, oak as a water, and then people name mostly the place with the uh, with the beginning with oak, which means that people really really what is really want to name the the place uh with the with the uh, with the condition of the area with the ecosystem of the area so i mean like for them water is a, like a dirt too is a the source of the life and then they say the ngalung people is like water seeker they always live around the around the body of the water and then the last one they always uh, think that uh, water as the identity of the place because mostly of the area even though the district the village and the special a uh, place they will beginning with oak so it's been when the uh, when the I mean like us of the government want to develop the area, they still they have to keep maintains the ecosystem. So if they will keep their identity of the Ngalum uh, people, and then the conclusion, I think they actually the indigenous people have already have their own uh, traditional system. justice for local water are crucial issue because nowadays a lot of development is leading to destruction and then a lot have uh, happening especially in Papua because we are in developing country and then right now for example we are the beginning only one province and then we separate it into two provinces and then now we already uh, divide it into six uh, provinces but it is important to to protect their uh, what is the place with related to the indigenous identity so they can keep maintain sustainable. And then the last one, they have their own sustainable water management in conservation, utilization, and can reducing the disaster. That's probably that uh, my sharing about the pump one. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, and for that great presentation. Again, uh, we appreciate uh, you being here and we and if you have questions for Elizabeth, please put them in the in the question and answer section so she can respond. Uh, our next um, presenter, as we move along here, is uh, Don Martin Hill from the University of uh, McAllister. She's talking about Haudenosaunee and water. So with that, uh, the floor is yours, Don. Thank you, Don. Don, we're not hearing you. Your audio may be off. Okay, how's that? The Onikinos team is led by indigenous knowledge holders who designed uh, the Global Water Futures um, Research Project, which is continued on now with the Global Climate Change Center. Um, it's knowledge holders, scholars, community experts, interdisciplinary scientists, from biologists, engineers to anthropologists and medical folks, as well as uh, others that have been helping us with our water, um, including lawyers for governance. Um, we prioritize rights, health, and community-led solutions. This includes monitoring water, training youth, creating bilingual tools, water sensors, VR simulations and story mapping our Great Lakes territory. Okay, my screen is frozen. I'm not sure what is happening. It 
could just maybe take a little time for the screens to change because you had mentioned that your presentation was quite heavy. Oh, so usually it uh, works pretty efficiently um, on these kinds of platforms. So I don't know what, why it's not working. Um, I don't want to waste time because we are really seven minutes uh, to cover a lot of territory. So I kind of know the, the PowerPoint by heart. Um, so what we have a tech team, and that's what I was focusing on today, was the uh, tech team of traditional ecological knowledge, uh, the work that we're doing. And part of that work is being able to bring together um, knowledge holders to address some of the solutions, some of the problems, metrics of water quality, which uh, was mentioned earlier, is different from what we would consider Canadian uh, metrics of water quality. Again, looking at animals, um, aquatic life, uh, doing an inventory to see how they're functioning and surviving is a good indicator for how human health will be impacted. Um, also being able to share with our community, the results is very important or what they call knowledge mobilization. So knowledge mobilization is what the tech team has been very effective in raising awareness around a variety of issues, um, as well as governance issues around water control. Because here along Six Nations, which is in the Great Lakes area, uh, on what they call Canada um, and Ontario, but our people have been here for thousands and thousands of years. So what we wanted to do is understand how the impacts of uh, companies, since we have 25 different wastewater treatment plants upstream from the river that you're looking at, um, what they did is they built dams along the uh, where our community is. It's one of the deepest areas of the Grand River and it also ends up then becoming the dump um, where the sediment is most contaminated. Uh, there are no water sensors from uh, government along the Grand River, along our territory. So the elders wanted us to build water sensors. So our engineers have built three different kinds of water sensors that the community guided and shaped uh, given what they're concerned with, which are carcinogens uh, and also toxic waste, such as mercury and arsenic. This is our source water. So in our research, we have a health team looking at uh, maternal health, looking at um, uh, overall health uh, through the health, Six Nations Health Services, and working closely to do surveys with our community stakeholders. And I think what the team learned is when the community controls the research and when they implement the research and uh, hire local people, um, the research results are, are, are far greater in terms of the reach that our community has and the engagement that they have with our project because it's a community project. They want to know the results. So what we had was a number of studies that showed maternal health was greatly affected by lack of access to clean water. So as you know, in Canada, we have boiled water advisories across many First Nations communities. Um, ours is not on that list because we do have a water treatment plant that we help pay for with our own funds. One of the problems, though, is there's no funding by the Canadian government to pipe that clean water into homes. And we have over 12,000 people living in our community and 27,000 members. What we found was even if we had the money to pipe in the clean water, or, uh, treated water, we don't have a waste treatment plant. So funding has been a, a barrier in many First Nations being able to access uh, clean water in their homes. So while we're not on the boiled water advisory list, only 12% of this community is actually connected to the water treatment plant. So that then impacts health. What was surprising about our findings was that uh, mental health was significantly impacted by the um, um, lack of access to clean water. We found mothers particularly who have to purchase water. It's about $250, that's what I pay. Um, for the truck to bring the, the water into our tanks. Um, 
economic stress of not having the funds to purchase the water. And then also we have to have funds. It's $92 to have the septic truck take away the waste. So it's an economic burden that creates a lot of anxiety and stress. People have to monitor their water, how much they have left, if they have funding to get the next uh, load. So those are the kinds of things most Canadians are completely unaware of that we just don't have access to clean water. On top of that, we have issues with um, the uh, extraction industry of water. Uh, Nestle, Blue Trite, and a number of industries are removing the aquifer. And one of the things the elders outlined was that the aquifer is in fact uh, the most precious water. That is like the breast milk of, of uh, what the creator made for us. So the story that I was going to show in the VR uh, virtual reality is is describing the value our people have from the time of creation and how the creator made the Great Lakes by using his fingers, which is why the U.S. calls them the Finger Lakes, um, to create what we call fresh water. So Haudenosaunee people have lived around the Great Lakes since the beginning of time, according to our creation. And we have stories about how the waters have changed over those times, as well as the climate. We also have a climate change adaptation committee. Um, the climate change study that we published um, demonstrates that Six Nations, as well as the region, is going to be water insecure moving into the future. So preserving and conserving what fresh water we have is the top priority, including our aquifer. There's no protections of aquifers in this country. Um, we need to do better in governance and we need to be at the table when it comes to water authority and governing our water. So our legal team has looked at the ways in which we can apply a number of different treaties, uh, a number of different um, um, uh, agreements that we've had in the past to be honored so that the taking of our aquifer stops. They take 3.6 million liters per day for the last eight years, and the province continues to hand out permits in which the Haudenosaunee traditional government has sent out a number of cease and desist orders, which have been duly ignored uh, by these industries. So the youth of the community have been leading much of our research. Part of our work is in the elders wanted was to make sure that our young people are uh, trained, are part of our research team. They work diligently on a number of different issues. And the outcome of all of that work is to create a um, training program. Many of the youth were critical that universities, including the one I work at, um, the local post-secondary does not have intensive land-based, water-based uh, courses, does not have environmental studies or traditional knowledge. So we've been working with our local post-secondary Six Nations Polytechnic, as well as McMaster to develop a traditional ecological knowledge program. The second outcome we found was we need to sustain this type of work. We can't live from grant to grant. It's, it's not a, a, a suitable arrangement. So one of the things we would like to do is to establish uh, an environmental research institute that is run by the many indigenous Haudenosaunee scholars. I think there's 12 of us from Six Nations, but also across Haudenosaunee lands and have a place that we can actually begin tackling climate change, uh, water access, and a number of other ecological issues um, using the, the skill set of our elders and how do we best mitigate the impact of climate change on our community and our access to clean water? So what we end up with um, after this study is creating tools, which you can find on our website, which is listed here. So you could see the VR if you go on our website. We also have about 20 publications from the different uh, sources that have worked with us, peer-reviewed scholar papers that acknowledge that indigenous knowledge leading and designing research teams is the best practice. Working, co-creating a number of uh, tools that communities need. One example that I use is you see how the West of Canada and the United States is on fire. Well, there's mitigation measures First Nations would have to offer if they were asked. Um, we used to be able to have burns and then they outlawed that. And 
part of the outcome is now you have out of control wildfires. So we have ways to manage our environment. What we don't have is the access to the funds. We don't have access to the uh, authority over our lands and waters. And as you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, study cited that um, where Indigenous people manage their water and their territory is the healthiest on the planet. And in fact, we hold some 80% of the entire planet's biodiversity. So our argument is and ends with, I'll end it here, is that we have the ability um, to manage these environments with our ancient knowledge mixed with contemporary uh, Western education and scientists when we work together. Um, what we find is that we can improve the outcomes of our waters and the source water and protect what's there, but also we need the support of governments, of institutions, in the same way that they ad addressed COVID, they should be doing the same thing to address access to clean water because it's not only gonna be First Nations, Indigenous people that don't have access, as we'll see across the world, uh, the UN cites some 40 to 50% of the world's population won't have access to clean water. So we're hoping this is a priority for scientific institutions, conservation agencies need to do better in working with us. And we have the ability and the skills, what we don't have is the access and the funding. Thank you, I'll leave it there. Well, thank you, Don, for that uh, wonderful presentation and we appreciate you being here and supporting uh, this uh, this event. Our, our final uh, presenter for this panel, before we move into a question and answer for our panel, is uh, Dr. Ballard from the University of Calgary, Alberta, where she'll be talking about First Nations optimal water management, decolonizing artificial flooding. So with that, Dr. Ballard, uh, the floor is yours. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you see my slides properly? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm uh, Merle Ballard. I'm uh, from Lake Martin First Nation in Canada. I'm I'm uh, with uh, the Treaty Two Territory, member of a Treaty Two Territory, and I'm Anishinaabe. I'm a fluent speaker of my language. That's my first language, my mother tongue. I'm going to be talking about uh, water management, and I'm going to be talking about a case study, uh, what I've been doing with uh, uh, researching Lakes and Martin over the past 10 years or so. And I'll be talking about uh, uh, the artificial flooding that's been going on. Uh, so I'll be talking about decolonizing water management, and I'll be talking about the three I'd seeing as a solution. Uh, so we have laws uh, that are out there uh, that are uh, that are uh, uh, that uh, work that uh, support indigenous peoples, uh, but they don't really support. The, for example, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article Ten, are, says that indigenous peoples are shown. Indigenous people uh, shall not be forcibly removed from their lands or territories, no relocation without free, prior, informed consent. And then Article 26, Indigenous peoples have the rights to lands, territories, and waters. We have the Emergency Measures Act in Manitoba, where it gives authority to the province uh, to do what what they can within the power to alleviate the situations. We have a water, we have a various water stewardship laws uh, within the province of where I'm from and across the country and other parts of the world too. And then we have our own laws that are original laws of the indigenous peoples of the Anishinaabe people. And within the, uh, these laws are um, the three I'm seeing uh, that I'm going to be talking about. And are talking about the importance. So, 
So my community was repeatedly flooded uh, since the first dam was built. Uh, it was built on the Fayford River. Uh, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's in the central Canada, it's in the interlake region. I'm just going to keep a track of the time here. And uh, the slide on the bottom left is of the Fayford Dam, which was uh, constructed in uh, 1962. And uh, this dam uh, diverted the water uh, from uh, upper on Lake Manitoba and uh, released the water into Lake St. Martin, which is where I'm from. And uh, they did so without consulting the First Nations people who live downstream. And there's uh, four First Nation communities living downstream. And there's no non-Indigenous communities living downstream along the lake. And then uh, they built another water control structure in 1970, 1970 uh, the Portage Diversion. And uh, this uh, further adds uh, to uh, the water that's going into Lake Manitoba and then releasing into Lake St. Martin. And what's happening is Lake St. Martin is becoming a water, is becoming a water holding tank. Uh, just imagine a bathtub where uh, where there's a drop of water that then that, that drops into the bathtub and eventually the bathtub overflows or so. That's what's, what's going on with Lake St. Martin. And in uh, 2011, uh, uh, was the flood of the century. The province of Manitoba called it in uh, 2011, where my community was was flooded out, and uh, the whole uh, the whole community was evacuated on May 8, 2011. Uh, the province gave a uh, 24 hour notice to. Uh, the First Nation people, my community, to evacuate, uh, giving them, uh, telling them uh, to take a few essentials, an overnight bag, that they'll be gone overnight, a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks, uh, the province said. And uh, uh, they were evacuated. The province did not tell them that, that they would be evacuated for a lifetime. Uh, those ones that I talk about are the articles uh, regarding uh, the UNRIP, that uh, the Indigenous peoples uh, should not be forcibly removed from their land. Uh, my community was was a forced relocated against against uh, their wishes without the free and, without the free and the prior informed consent. And uh, this is my mom's house, the one on the bottom. Uh, right hand corner before the flood. My mom, my mom uh, told me to take a picture of her. Like uh, she does, she's not the person that wants pictures taken. But I guess uh, she had a premonition, uh, which a lot of elders do. They know events that are going to happen. And then she used to have a beautiful yard. Uh, she took care of her yard, uh, grew flowers. And uh, this is, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, this is her house, the one in the gray here, it's all underwater. And this is uh, 2013. Uh, this is where my mom's house used to be, right where my mouse is, I'm not sure you see the mouse, but uh, that's where my mom's house used to be. So that the, uh, the traditional lands of the people were completely stripped, uh, taken away by the province, and they were relocated. Uh, my community was relocated a couple of uh, kilometers from the original community in the bush, without, uh, without uh, given a, without uh, being given a choice of uh, where they want to be relocated. And uh, this uh, flooding was uh, totally unnecessary. They could have uh, diverted uh, the water somewhere else. And what happens when uh, people are flooded out, uh, the culture is affected. 
uh, the children are affected, uh, the social ties are affected, and the environment is quite affected, uh, the tradition is affected, everything is impacted. Uh, during this time, uh, the province uh, the province implemented uh, the Emergency Measures Act, and uh, they came up with $100 million uh, to build this um, channel where they diverted the excess water from Lakes and Martin, which they put in the first place, and, they've, and then they diverted the water. And then meanwhile, when we asked for new land, when we identified uh, where we wanted uh, to be relocated, uh, they said, no, it doesn't have it. it it doesn't have infrastructure. There's no money to be relocated there. Meanwhile, and they come with with a hundred million dollars that they spent on this channel, uh, which had disrupted uh, the bio, uh, the biodiversity in the area and affected uh, the water at uh, the water on uh, the other side uh, going into Lake Manitoba. Uh, so the framework I've been working on is a three-eight thing, uh, which identifies a better way uh, to manage uh, the land and uh, the waters because uh, we have to use uh, the knowledge uh, forms that are out there, the indigenous science of the people, the Anishinaabe laws uh, with, the, with the indigenous science, with the indigenous knowledge of uh, the creation law, the natural law, language law, traditional law, we have to respect. Uh, we have to respect our relations, which means the land, water, the air, flora, and the fauna. We have to recognize that they're they're alive too, and they have a voice. And we have to be the speakers. We have to speak for them. What is uh, the water telling us? What is uh, the fish are telling us that? that lives in the water? What are the birds that telling us that, that, that they use of the water? What is that the land telling us? We have to be the voice of indigenous peoples because indigenous peoples are stewards of the land. They recognize what's going on. They recognize the changes that are happening in real time. Indigenous peoples are uh, the first responders to the land because uh, the changes uh, that are happening in real time, uh, they're the first ones to identify. There's a, there's a something wrong here. And indigenous peoples will be the first ones uh, to identify a problem. But indigenous scientists, they want to be the ones taking the lead. Uh, they don't acknowledge uh, something unless uh, they discover it. They, um, uh, the discovery. But we have to recognize that uh, we have uh, we have a close relationship with our relations. And with Western science, uh, we can work together and to be part of the solution. Natural law uh, refers to uh, the way uh, the earth was uh, created, uh, the original purpose of the water, lands, air, flora, the cycles. And uh, these are really important uh, for indigenous peoples because uh, this is what uh, what enabled indigenous peoples uh, to survive uh, since the time immemorial in this great con these lands that we live on. Language law is really important too because being uh, being an Anishinaabemwin speaker, I know that a lot of the words that are named uh, within our within the country, probably other countries too, uh, with indigenous peoples, we have uh, languages that are based on uh, the role or the purpose of the ecosystem of uh, the river, for example, or the province even. Like uh, for example. Uh, Saskatchewan, uh, the province of uh, Saskatchewan means uh, where the water drains or where the water where the water runs dry. So if you think of that, 
if you think of the landscape of Saskatchewan, it's all flat and a lot of it is a different landscape uh, where uh, the minerals of a certain area, they, they absorb the water. And uh, the indigenous uh, peoples observed this before the boundaries were made. And that's why, uh, that's why, uh, that's why uh, they named it. And the language flow is really important uh, when we start identifying, uh, when we start monitoring changes within uh, the ecosystem, we have to look back on uh, the original naming of the ecosystems of the waters before the settlers came. The creation law is important as well. And the creation law is about uh, the balance, the harmony of the earth and everything, the stars and everything associated with it. The traditional laws are important as well. They refer uh, to the laws of nature, but they are embedded within the language as well. Within my language, uh, we have uh, we have words that guide our behavior in the way we look after the land. In Jine, they guide us in uh, the way we respect, the way we look after the land and other species that are around us. We are not to harm others because uh, they are living as well. When we do something, we're taught gigabatawa, meaning that if you do something, uh, you'll uh, um, these words are really Anishinaabe <laughs> language gigabatawa. Um, um, Uh, someone else uh, will suffer the consequences beside you. Then we have uh, the seven teachings uh, that guide us as well, uh, law of respect, harmony, etc. And uh, these are very important. And uh, when uh, we grow up too, we have other teachings uh, that are passed down uh, from our parents, our mothers, our uh, the people around us. And that's how we learn. For example, when I was growing up, I always had the teachings from my extended family, which indigenous peoples, we all have extended families. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, the area that I'm from, and this is what I'm talking about regarding uh, the flooding. And uh, these are the communities that are, uh, uh, that are in, um, downstream from the from the Fairford Dam. And uh, this is uh, one of the communities of Fairford and then La Saskatchewan, Lake St. Martin First Nation, and then uh, Dauphin River. So these were the four communities that were evacuated uh, during the flood of uh, 2011. But my community was uh, the one that was 100% evacuated and uh, the only one that was, um, was forced relocated. And uh, this picture, uh, picture was taken in in uh, 2018, 19. Uh, this is adjacent uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the new community of Lake St. Martin, and uh, you can see the uh, the tree stands. Uh, there's a lot of uh, dead trees, and uh, what the elders said were um, when uh, we were being relocated there. They said that uh, there is water coming up uh, from the ground table is coming up, but the water from the ground table is coming up. That's what they said. Uh, like I said, uh, Lake St. Martin is becoming a holding tank. Uh, so imagine the holding tank, everything will be saturated eventually. So uh, when we think of our relations, uh, they're dying too, and we have to be the voice. Uh, we have to be the voice for them. Uh, they're having uh, the elders say that uh, the roots are rotting because they're all wet, and that's why they 
they're dead. So we have to be the voice of, for them as well. Uh, this was taken in uh, Lake Samaritan, uh, the south basin of Lake Samaritan. Uh, they propose, uh, by the way, uh, they're proposing another outlet channel number two to come from Lake Manitoba straight into the south basin. And uh, we have to be the voice. Uh, we have to be the voice for our relations because if they build a second channel, uh, they're going to destroy uh they're going to destroy the habitat. And this is where uh, various water species uh, spend their spring, summer, fall. Uh, they live here. This is where they raise their little families. And uh, this is uh, this is their uh, this is their little territory. So if uh, there's another outlet channel, this will be this will be destroyed. Uh, they will have to be relocated too. And as well, to a lot of the waters along Lake St. Martin, especially the eastern area, will be destroyed as well. There's a lot of uh, traditional, uh, ter uh, traditional, uh, traditional waters along that area with a lot of, uh, with a lot of uh, cultural uh, significance, history, of. Of uh, Memingwishes, I don't know if you know Memingwishes, but uh, those are stories of the little people that live there along that area. Plus, uh, uh, there's a lot of a uh, migration, migration site uh, spawning grounds of uh, the fish along the eastern side as well. So those will be destroyed, uh, and as well too, there's a lot of uh, natural springs within uh, the east side of Lake St. Martin, which will be destroyed if uh, this uh, water control structure comes through. It was so it's important uh, to work together. Uh, this was taken in Dauphin River. Uh, this is one of my students uh, taking water samples of Dauphin River. This is where that uh, the first outset channel I was diverted to. So uh, we were taking samples of the water, uh, what happened uh, with the water, any changes, etc. Uh, so uh, what we have to recognize is whenever there's uh, changes with the water, when uh, when a natural law is uh, when natural law is interrupted our relations. The land weeps, and we have to recognize that. We have to read the voice for that. Because as indigenous peoples, we have uh, that uh, that responsibility that and that role that was given to us uh, to be the caretakers of the land. We have to be the voice for the land. Uh, and um when water when water uh, when water levels are interrupted indigenous peoples know the changes that are happening on the lands waters that they know when uh, the fish patterns uh, when the fish patterns are out of uh, uh when they're not normal uh, the habitats or uh, the water flows uh, they talk about a current being reversed etc and uh, the fish in spring spots are now in the fall spots or so they reverse and uh, these are some of the things that uh, western science cannot readily observe because they don't live on the land they don't see that and then uh, the fish to uh, the declining fisheries uh, my uncle shared the stories with me of Lake St. Martin, how they caught uh, so many uh, whitefish uh, during uh, during uh, the 70s uh, that one of the fish officers, uh, commerce officers, uh, came up to them and accused them of uh, stealing fish, and yet it was caught from Lake St. Martin. Now there's hardly any fish there because of the change in the, 
the water cycle from the constant flooding, a constant water manipulation of Lake St. Martin from the Payford Dam, where uh, water is uh, water is increased uh, some years and then it's so dry you can just walk out for miles and miles and then it floods or where uh, where entire communities are flooded out so this goes against uh, the natural laws. And it's important that indigenous science are being incorporated into uh, water management because like uh, the previous uh, speaker, Don Martin Hill said, uh, we are the ones with the knowledge and uh, without, and acknowledging that the indigenous science, indigenous knowledge systems were here before the Western knowledge systems is really important because uh, we know the land, we knew the land, and we still know the land. So we still know the water cycles, et cetera. And uh, working these uh, with indigenous science and uh, the use of a modern uh, technology too really helps. So, so uh, bridging these uh, two together, indigenous and Western science. Uh, this was taken a couple of uh, years ago in Lake St. Martin. Um, uh, we were doing uh, we were doing uh, Nishna Bimwin, uh the use of indigenous language in uh, the uh, naming of uh, spaces and places around the lake, uh, which is really important because uh, they identify the original naming, what that means, and when the flood happened, what does that mean after uh, what has changed. And uh, uh, that's all I have to share. I knew that I only had so much time. Yeah. Well, that's, that's that was great. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Ballard, and um, thank you all panelists again for your great presentations. And I know time is always an issue with these kind of things, so we want to respect everybody's time who who share, who shared their uh, their day with us, their morning with us, or evening with us today. And so. Um, um, what I want to do as moderator is just maybe ask one question of the panelists and if you could just um, be respectful of the time today uh, so we can kind of conclude on time. So um, we did talk about, and we did, we did in the beginning talk about the importance of earth observations. And I know I've heard uh, earth observations sort of from a Western science uh, perspective, but also I also heard and saw earth observations from an indigenous perspective. And so my question to the panelists is, um, how do, how do we bring um, bring these things these two knowledge, these two ways of understanding the earth together or should we and how do we do that and i know there's some examples here that i saw but also just for the audience for the, give the audience um, a perspective and uh, and some thinking some challenging to them of how we bring these two knowledge systems together earth observations from western perspective and uh, from the indigenous perspective so i'm going to start um, with uh, yolanda and janet that question, please. Um, I, th I think that's a fantastic question. And uh, I think that we uh, really have got some great examples of where uh, we've, we've worked with um, Indigenous science and knowledge as well as earth observation that often give us a much uh, larger spatial coverage. And I think the, the indigenous knowledge and science can be uh, used to interpret some of the, the satellite observations that we're seeing over a much wider area. Uh, and I think that there's also the opportunity with earth observation that we've got time series of data in some cases, we've got uh, time series of data going back 50 years, which seems a long time for an Earth observation scientist. But when you combine that with um, traditional or Indigenous knowledge, which goes back in our country, goes back up to 65,000 years, you 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 um, are really only getting a very small picture of what's happened in, in the country. So I think it's really important to take that perspective of the Indigenous science and knowledge. 
Thank you, Janet. Uh, Yolanda, any thoughts at this point? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Janet, for giving us this um, very important answer. Uh, I think I, I just want to add that if we um, if we put on a timeline, when was, uh, I don't know, the first satellite um, on the space? When was this launch? Or what? how old is uh, NASA or all these institutions and organizations um, that observe our planet and we compare uh, how long indigenous peoples have been observing natural phenomena without having the technology we have today. So we can realize that this information that uh, indigenous peoples um, can provide is very important. And also considering that uh, some of the, for example, um, astronomical events have not been occurred yet. Like for example, the Mayas were very good in predicting uh, astronomical, uh, I don't know, equinoxes, etc. And we are, uh, still waiting for those to happen. So I think it's very uh, precise, it's very accurate, it's very important to include these ob observations into the understanding of the global, of our planet. Um, yeah, it's the only thing I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yolanda. Brad, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bradley, same question to you. Yeah, it is a cracking question. Um, <laughs> I... Um, yeah. Oh, how long we got? Two two hours to <laughs> talk to <this. laughs> you. Got, you got two minutes. Seconds. Two minutes. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I, I just following on from Janet. Yeah, like Australian uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a long connection to their the respective countries. You know, over three hundred different language groups, and you know, we're the driest inhabited continent continent on earth. Um, but yet we don't have a say in how water is managed. Um, and I suppose that that's a real challenge for us. Um, but I suppose the more we uh, provide evidence of our knowledge and the our own oh. cultural validation of our knowledge um, rather than the science, scientific paradigm, um, we actually start to influence policy. Um, so, you know, like um, Yolanda talked about, you know, observations of the stars you know our people hunted by the stars live by the stars and you know they, they, they were mimicking what was on earth uh some of the you know the, the milky way and uh that we have an emu in the sky that um you know is a large flightless bird and the emu appears in the dark matter of the, the milky way and you know we hunt by that but also those those understandings of of changes in in climate you know i think we we as indigenous people in australian context we need to enter the space as well uh, we need to, you know, stand up. It's um, there's not many indigenous scientists, you know. We've in, in our context, we've only been counted as humans since the late 1960s. Uh, we weren't allowed to go to university. We weren't, weren't allowed to enter towns and things like that. So, you know, that's my mum's generation. It's not my. I was born a human, so I'm very lucky. Um, and I suppose we need more a, a generation of indigenous scientists coming through the system, but we also need to make sure that they are culturally centred with the two-way knowledge. So the, the Western, they're learning the Western, so we're infiltrating the system, but we're also connected to our cultural ways. And, and those two, the two coming together will provide solutions uh, for a better future. Um, and, you know, we have so many existential threats. You know, climate change is here now. The climate has changed. You know, we've got communities being battered by droughts and, and flooding rains and, you know, like a community in on the East Coast had two one in 500 year flood events. They should only happen every 500 years. They had two in a matter of months. And so, you know, that that's our, that's the climate changing. You know, we've got small islands off Northern Australia that have sea level rise hitting now and they've got, you know, saltwater intrusion impacting on freshwater lenses and, yeah, so I suppose I suppose what I'm trying to say is that indigenous knowledge can, can can play a part and should play a part in how we recover and care for this land, um, this old continent of Australia. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm I'm here for the long haul. I'm not going anywhere. And I suppose, you know, if I can inspire a generation, the next generation, to think about science as as a pathway 
but also mm-hmm. connect them culturally and make sure they're safe uh, in that space, then, you know, I think we can we can provide opportunities uh, to, to, to manage the continent and then also benefit the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. That's a great, quite, great answer. Uh, how about you, uh, Elizabeth? Same question to you about how do we work with both systems, Western science and indigenous knowledge when it comes to earth observations? Yes, uh, thank you. Very, very nice question. Actually, on my perspective, uh, between the indigenous, indigenous people and then the nature is inseparable. So, I mean, like when we talk about uh, what is for, uh, I mean, like always inseparable. So, I mean, like actually my background is civil engineering. Mm-hmm. But when I is civil engineering and I learn about the structure and anything. But after this time, I focus that actually between the scientists and then indigenous knowledge actually in line. For example, in Papua, we have a lot of suspended bridge. The local people in the mountain area of Papua, they do not have to come to the college to learn how to make bridge, but they already have the knowledge how to make the bridge. And then, you know, in Papua, we are, we have also the, what is the three houses in Korowai uh, tribe. And then they do not have to learn about that side. So I do believe that actually when we dig in more, when we explore more, actually there is a, what is parallel between the traditional knowledge and the science. And then now, now in uh, in example in Papua, for example, when I did something related to the to the what is the policy of the government, I learned from the Australia, I learned from also New Zealand and other place how to involve the traditional ecological knowledge into the policy. Because why? Because I do believe that the traditional knowledge is more sustainable, you know, because they already already prove uh, intergeneration. And then more I learn and then more I think it's really a mesh, you know, the, the look the indigenous people already already understand about the the phenomena and anything and they, they already do really really what is really concerned about the, the impact of negative impact of the development. So I think that the traditional knowledge should be integrate into the the scientists. Thank you. Thank you. Uh question to you, Don, same question. Traditional knowledge, Western science, earth observations. Um, I, I posted the article that our team, well, one of the teams uh, wrote about reconciling um, uh, through science um, in ways that we can work together. And there's actually recommendations in there um, that were drafted by uh, over 400 scientists, uh, calls to action, natural scientists, and then we added more to the engineering and, and, and side of things. But um I think the key is that indigenous knowledge holders, and that doesn't mean just anybody. That means we have specialized fields. We have medicine people. We have, we have our harvesters, our hunters. You know, you need you need to understand what indigenous methodology and pedagogies are, um, protocols, and they are different from community to community. Um, based on your nation and and your your culture, um, there is again gender knowledge, women's knowledge. Uh, in our culture, women manage and steward water. We're part of the grandmother, as I cited in the beginning. Um, she manages water. Um, we're all made of water. Humans are. So you know, there's connections and understandings about you know gender roles, and and also there's also an important aspect in that. You know, while my team has been incredible, they've never worked with indigenous people. These are engineers and biologists that work in labs. Um, it, it took a lot of work on our end to basically train them on how to engage ethically um, and, and intellectual property rights was a real concern that this knowledge is ours and it needs to not be co-opted or appropriated or taken out of context. And that's what's happened in the past um, with our knowledge, uh, it's been appropriated. So there's a big concern that there needs to be acknowledgement um, that indigenous people have always had engineering, architecture, medicine. It was just suppressed and oppressed through colonialism, residential schools for the last 150 years. So we're playing catch up. So I've been pushing hard at the government level that they have more funds for indigenous communities, leaders, scholars to lead research, to design it with their communities, because we have those sacred relationships 
we've earned the trust of our elders and our people. Um, and, and they are our allies. So the scientists that I work with understand, you know, we're going to do things a bit differently. And if, if you're not able to adjust uh, some of the ways in which you do things, um, then it's probably not going to work. So I think it's important to be honest up front. Mm -hmm. You know, intellectual property belongs to us. Uh, we don't want our knowledge to be then uh, taken out of context. That is at, like you see the new age movement with our spirituality. There's the same fear that this is going to happen with scientists and 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 our our elders' knowledge. So there has to be a level of governance over our own intellectual property and understanding that we will lead. And I, that's the key. We need to lead and design the research. So I went to public works guys who test water every day, all day long. They're the local experts, right? Or or the nurses or the midwives who see the families that don't have water and they're worried about their prenatal, postnatal health. Mm -hmm. They're the experts. And then we have specific elders who have knowledge uh, of different aspects. Some are medicine, some are the fish, some are uh, uh, language, because uh, Indigenous knowledge is in the language. It's mm -hmm. in our songs. It's in our dances. We dance mm -hmm. for the fish. We have stories. So translating that is not easy to science, but you do have experts now. As Bradley mentioned, there are a few of us. Um, but what we don't have access to is the funding. And that that's the the heart of the matter is that non-indigenous people are privileged to get, you know, access to multi-million dollar grants and and they might get one native person to sit on that and say, well, I have native covered. Um, I'm a reviewer and I can tell you in Canada, you won't get the grant if you operate on that level. It has to be where we lead the research if you're in our community. And that self-government, self-determination and human rights have to be a part of that package. So we do write about this. If you go to our website, we, we have, as I mentioned, not only a lot of scholarly publications, but we also have booklets that we create for the community to translate mm -hmm the science in, in a way that our people can embrace and understand and, and respond to. And I can tell you like Six Nations Health Services, Six Nations Public Works, they've all taken the data from the climate change or from the house and they've created programs and services and land-based healing and land-based learning out of these uh, results. So you need to be able to get the results back into the leaders in your community so that they can all work collectively to address climate change and water security and food security. That would be my response. Yeah. Well, thank you, Don. That was great. Um, Dr. Ballard, uh, also uh, to you, how do we bring uh, these two ways of knowing together and in terms of earth observation, data science and technology? Uh, well, I think I talked about that in my presentation, uh, the three I'd seen. I think that's the way to go mm. uh, because we need to include uh, the voices of water as well. It's so important uh, with Indigenous peoples being the conduit, being the voice of the water, and uh, to understand what uh, what the water is saying is really important. So uh, the three I'd seen approach is... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, is really important and uh, indigenous peoples, like I said, being the first responders of the land, they know what's going on in the waters, the lands, species, everything. And uh, they'll be the voice uh, and being the first responders uh, when something happens, like emergency, the first responders that take the uh, transport a person to a hospital or something. And that's the same way with what's happening on the land. Indigenous people being the first responders. Uh, but at the same time, too, Indigenous peoples, um, uh, we have to be the leaders. Uh, we can't just uh, sit back. We have to take, uh, we have to be uh, mm -hmm. a more informative and uh, be the leaders. Being the leaders of change, uh, we have to lead uh, our water management. As someone was saying that 
uh, indigenous led water management is the best solution where there's uh, uh, where there's data showing that indigenous led management water management uh, water management are the healthiest and uh, this is the way we need to go well with that i i uh we better stop. <laughs> well, it, it, no, this is great. I, I want to say uh, thank you to our our sponsors. And um, on the slide here, we have uh, websites and information about all the organizations that are involved in a webinar. So I want to thank our sponsors and also thank you and more importantly, the, the panelists. Uh, we brought good information. You brought wisdom. You brought knowledge. And most importantly, you brought yourselves. And I hope that going forward, that Geo Aqua Watch, the Geo Digital Alliance, and others will facilitate continued discussion and conversation, but more importantly, action of how we protect our water for our, our next seven generations. And so in 2016, in my part of the country, part of the world, there was something called the Dakota Access Pipeline. And it was there that million, uh, thousands of indigenous people gathered to protect uh, the water and to bring our prayers and our ceremonies together to advance a better world for our future. And so like that, we continue to strive and navigate and uh, bring our, our ceremony and prayers together to protect the water, to work with the water, and to work with each other. So I want to thank you again, all the audience here as well, for your for your um, your patience with us, because uh, we can talk more, and I want to do that more. And so let's continue to figure out how we, we build a platform to share uh, what we have, what we're doing with one another, and let's build and be good relations. So that because of the water and because of things that we need to do as indigenous people and our allies. So with that, I want to close our session today and say, Wopi Latanka, Ichichi Apalo. Thank you all very much. Everybody have a good day and take care. <laughs>